Can you imagine what this tournament's going to be like, ladies? No, I cannot. Yeah. So let's get to some teams, teams let's go. shall we? All right, so, so important. You want to be a top seed. Four teams get to do that. Who are they? We'll tell you right now. The number one overall seed, it is Nebraska. Stanford is a number one seed. Wisconsin. And the fourth one, whoo, going to Pitt. So important, if you are a top seed, if you win first and second rounds, that means you get to host regionals. Huge. And that's huge. So what do you think about the top four that we have here? Well, I think the committee got it right. I think one and two were knowns. And then you obviously had Wisconsin, who beat Nebraska in a sweep at the end of the regular season. I think there was a clump of teams for that third and fourth one seed. And I think that that sweep against Nebraska elevated Wisconsin. And then Pittsburgh getting in was huge. I agree. I think Pittsburgh really finished the season strong. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference for them. They had a little bit of a rough start at the beginning, but they ironed things out. They have two key freshmen in their lineup, and they've been really impressive defensively. I think you'll see the selection committee valued. What have you done for me lately? How did teams finish? So, okay. We know the top four seeds. Are you ready for the rest of the bracket? We've got it right here in front of us. The NCAA volleyball bracket. Key tournament dates. Go ahead. Mark your calendar. All matches covered on ESPN Plus and our ESPN family of networks. It starts on Thursday with first and second rounds. We also are going to have the fifth set. It's back. That's our whip around show. You can see on ESPN Plus. It'll bounce around to all the first and second round matches. Most importantly, for the very first time, our national championship match will be on ABC. That is on December 17th in Tampa. Well, Nebraska is the number one overall seed in this tournament, and it's incredible what they've done this season. They added six new ears, six new players, if you will, on this roster, came in, and they figured things out. And, of course, John Cook is not going to make an easy schedule for his Nebraska Cornhuskers. They played a tough road, but they started 27-0. Best start since 2005. They led the nation with nine wins against top 25 teams in the RPI. How will they fare as they continue to make their way to Tampa? So Nebraska, this is the top left quarter of the bracket. Nebraska, the number one overall seed. Who will they face? LIU, Long Island University, the Sharks are in. They started the season 1-12, but they are 10-2 in their last 12 matches. They will be heading to Lincoln. Also going to Lincoln, that would be Delaware, the Blue Hens. They were the second seed, and they defeated the top seed, Towson, in the conference tournament to claim their fifth conference tournament title. Delaware taking on Missouri. Don Sullivan in her first season as Missouri's head coach. She comes over from UNLV. 17 wins, more than the 14 it had in the previous two seasons combined. The number five seed is Georgia Tech, Holly. Georgia Tech, Bianca Bertolino is fourth in the country with aces per set. But she's the only power five player that has 300 kills, 250 digs, and 50 aces. That is a full stat line for Georgia Tech, and they have two top ten wins. Yeah, you bet it is. Yellow Jackets, who will they be taking on? Well, that would be South Alabama, their second appearance, first since 2021. Kaylee Keeble, the conference setter of the year, and two 20-win seasons in the last three years under coach Jesse Ortiz. FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast, making its fourth appearance, three straight tournaments. They're the regular season conference champion, winning their third straight tournament title by sweeping Lipscomb and Ella Chapman, named that A-Sun Freshman of the Year. They have to face an in-state foe in the Florida Gators, Holly. Florida Gators were the hottest team in the country to start mm -hmm. this season, number two early on, but they lost All-American setter Alexis Stuckey. Kennedy Muff has taken over, and I'll tell you, they've got a really impressive, impressive freshman in Kennedy Martin on the opposite, one of the biggest scorers in the country. Yeah, she is incredible. Okay, we continue in the Nebraska quarter. Who is that number three seed? Do to do it would be the Arkansas Razorbacks, Katie. Let me tell you about Jill Gill. You do have it. SEC coaches actively checking to see if Arkansas's outside hitter still has eligibility left. They don't want to face her anymore. If you want a rooting interest or a new favorite player in this tournament, watch Jill Gill and play for the Razorbacks. You'll thank me later. So who is Arkansas going to take on? Well, that would be Stephen F. Austin. They won the WAC regular season title, lead the nation in team blocks, and Elizabella Ortiz eighth nationally 
with her 149 total blocks. How about this TCU program? Melanie Parra transfers in from Texas. She's second in the conference in points per set. The first player in school history to have two 34 kill matches in her career. And the Horn Frogs, their first round matchup will be against Florida State, Katie. Co-ACC champs this year, Chris Poole's team did an excellent job. After starting six and six, the Seminoles kicked things into gear, finished ACC play 15 and two. They're led by Audrey Koenig. Still working in that Nebraska quarter, the upper left portion of the bracket. Number seven, James Madison, back-to-back -back appearances for the Dukes. And James Madison's first opponent, it's going to be the Baylor Bears eight straight appearances. They close the season with back-to-back -back wins. Had 12 matches against ranked teams this year. Finishing out this portion of the bracket, Wofford Terrier. We got a first timer, first, first appearance timers. in the NCAA tournament. They were the three seed, and they defeated the fourth seed, Samford, in the SoCon Tourney Finals. Their 23 wins, the most in their D1 era. That's since era since, since 1995, and they entered the tournament on an eight-match win streak. But they've got a doozy in front of them. The number two seed, the Kentucky Wildcats, won their seventh consecutive SEC title by sweeping. Sweeping Arkansas, and you know Craig Skinner is always going to have his teams ready to go when it comes time for the postseason. So here again, the upper left quarter of the bracket and the Nebraska quarter. Here are the teams stacking up there. Going back to this Nebraska team, obviously they have talent. They have a great history in this tournament. When you think about Nebraska, though, a staple of that program, Holly, is always their defense. Well, that's the backbone of this Nebraska team. They've got tons of young talent offensively, but wow. Lexi Rodriguez, two-time All-American, and she is one of the best Libros in the country. Not only does she dig a ton of balls, she digs them with control so her team can attack back. That's why they're one of the toughest teams to play in the country. She keeps them in system, allowing Nebraska to hit for very high numbers. Watch her take this middle ball. This is a ball that drops against most teams. She puts it right in her setter's hands, and Harper Murray does the rest. No balls dropping against this Nebraska defense, and it's also contagious. If she's digging that many balls, her teammates better step up with her. Lainey Choboy has been a great addition to the Nebraska backcourt. She is fearless. Look at her down on one knee and she gets up, runs for the ball, keeps it alive to stay in the rally. And I love this play high off the block, finds the back line, but no, Lainey Choboy lays it out to keep it alive and keep Nebraska in the play. They frustrate you as opposing attackers. They make it so difficult to place the ball on the floor. Ugh. Yeah, and they've been constantly at the top of the defense. You take a look at the 2020 season. That's the only season outside of the top 50 since 2015. So that defense certainly a staple, and that continues third in the nation in that mark this year for Nebraska. Okay, going to the two seed in this quarter of the bracket, bra excuse me, bracket, the <laughs> Nebraska. Kentucky Wildcats. Number one strength of schedule, Craig Skinner, you never make it easy on your team, right? But hey, he gets them ready. <laughs> it pays off. And you know what? Kentucky opened the season and struggled a little bit. They dealt with some injury, Reagan Rutherford being that key injury middle of the season. But it's always incredible, Holly. Craig Skinner's team, time and time again, they seem to click at the right time. They did. They just continued to get better as the season went on. And when Reagan Rutherford got healthy, they just fired on all cylinders. All those other players stepped up, and they were that much better. Certainly helps when you have a veteran setter running the show and Emma Grome does just that. She currently leads the nation in assists per set just over 12. She's a little bit undersized but my goodness she is so fast with her feet. She is the steadying factor for this Kentucky offense. Craig Skinner says she has a great feel for tempo and location all along the net. She also understands good balance and distribution. She has been so much fun to watch throughout her career in Lexington. And she's learning from the 2020 National Player of the Year at Madison Lilly, who told us that Emma Grome is just Grome is such a rhythmic setter. It's so much fun Can't to hurt. work with her. It cannot hurt. Also, Kentucky boasting the SEC Freshman of the Year, Brooklyn Delay. They won their seventh straight SEC title, and they entered the tournament on a 16-match winning streak. I don't think anybody wants to face the Kentucky Wildcats right now. So those are a couple of teams we talked about. But, guys, there are so many players in mm -hmm. this quarter alone to watch. Holly, who else are you watching in I, this portion? Well, I like Taylor Head for Arkansas. She's part of the one-two punch 
with Jill Gillen, and they have been dangerous. And she's part of that backcourt that's been together for three years and makes Arkansas so dangerous. And then you've got Melanie Parr, one of the best servers and scorers in the country for TCU. I like both those players. I put Bianca Bertolino right there with Parra in terms of serving ability. I would not want to be on the other end of it. That thing is absolutely lethal. It is moving. And then you got Corey Lewis from Florida State at middle blocker. She is so powerful, but she plays air free, clean volleyball, and coaches love that. Oh, absolutely they do. I guarantee you, no matter what match you turn on, you're going to see superstars out there on the court. A lot of great players. Okay, so we've showed you some teams. Are we ready for more? We are. Yes, please. Let's do it. We're going to the bottom left portion of the bracket, starting from the bottom, working our way up, where Pitt is the number one seed, eight consecutive appearances. Of course, they made the semifinals in 2021 and 2022. They shared the ACC title with Florida State. So who do the Panthers open up with? It's another first-timer, ladies. Coppin State, their first appearance. They posted a school record 27 wins and won back-to-back 20 win seasons for the first time in school history. Continuing on, UMBC, the Retrievers, the fourth consecutive American East championship for them, the second American East program to win four straight titles. Their opponent, it's going to be the eighth seed, the USC Trojans, Holly. And USC able to get in. They've had 14 different lineups because they've had so many injuries, but they've got one of the best scores in NCAA history in Skyler Fields, and they have some good weapons that have been hot lately for them. Now, speaking of a hot team, how about the number five seed? in this bracket. That would be Dayton. They have the longest winning streak in the nation, Katie. Well, the Flyers let it fly from the service line, that's for sure. Statistically, the best serving team in the country. A season ago, they went 20 and 13. Fine, good season. They added 11 wins this season to go 31 and 2. Unbelievable. So who does Dayton face? That would be the Pepperdine Waves, their first West Coast Conference title since 2011, their 12th overall. They defeated last year's semifinalist, San Diego. Remember, they made it to the national semifinals. They beat them to clinch the title back on November 12th. Grand Canyon, the Lopes, first ever WAC tournament title by defeating the regular season champion Stephen F. Austin. And they're led by Claire Mitchell, the three-time WAC setter of the year. The opponent for Grand Canyon, that would be Washington State, Holly. And this is a senior-led team. There's grad students and seniors and fifth, fifth years. There's 12 of them, so lots of experience. And Magda Yelisharova is the NCAA active leader in blocks. Again, we're in the bottom left portion of the bracket, the Pittsburgh quarter. Who will be the number three seed in this portion? Well, it's the Creighton Blue Jays. They've appeared in 10 of the last 11 tournaments, their ninth Big East tournament title in the last 10 years. Keanu Schmidt was named the tournament MVP, and they're the highest-ranked non-Power 5 team in the RPI at 12. Their opening opponent will be the Colgate Raiders making its fourth straight appearance. They won a four, third straight title by sweeping American. Actually started the season two and four before reeling off 13 consecutive wins. They are in. Next up, Minnesota. Keegan Cook, his first season leading the Golden Gophers. Senior Kylie Murr transferred in. She's the second player in the Big Ten history with 2,300 digs. And Melanie Schaffmaster, just a mainstay in this Minnesota offense. Their opponent will be the sixth seed, Utah State, the second highest RPI rank of non-Power 5 teams. They come in at 16 and they ended the regular season on a 14-match winning streak. That's their longest since 1980. Okay. <laughs> Moving on up, Auburn Tigers third appearance, Katie. War Eagle, Brent Crouch's group, started the season on a tear at 10-1, and one, played extremely well in non-conference, had some ups and downs throughout SEC play, but Akasha Anderson and Madison Shear are an absolute force in the front row for the Tigers. Auburn's opponent, Western Michigan. They joined Dayton as the only 30-win teams this season, 30-2 and two record for the Western Michigan Broncos. Wright State swept number two, the number two seed Green Bay to capture its second consecutive tourney title. They're going to enter this tournament on a nine match winning streak with four consecutive sweeps and the number two seed. It is the Louisville Cardinals. They made the semifinals two years ago. They made the championship match last year. Danny Busboom Kelly always has this program going on the right track and they will be the number two seed in the Pittsburgh quarter. Very interesting 
Here are the teams again, the bottom left portion of the bracket. Okay, so you know how important it is to be a number one seed. And Pitt gets it over Louisville. What do you think, Katie? Yeah, I thought it was interesting being able to speak with the committee about their decisions. They said the most difficult decision of this bracket was who was going to get that fourth and final one seed. It was between Pittsburgh and Louisville, and Pittsburgh got the edge. A couple of data points led them to this decision. Pitt has two more top 50 RPI wins than Louisville. Pitt has one more top 25 RPI win. When it came down to common opponents, Pitt won 17 compared to Louisville's 15. And in their last 10 matches of the season, Pitt won nine, Louisville won eight. The committee member said the devil is in the details and Pittsburgh got the edge. Yeah, again, such a competitive bracket this year. Yeah. I mean, there were so many matchups. We'll hear from the, the committee chair coming up later, but so interesting to see. And I'm glad I didn't have to make the bracket up. Louisville and Pittsburgh, they can't get away from each other. No, nope. they cannot. <laughs> Ooh, a little drama. Let's go to Pitt, though. I know you love what Rachel Fairbanks does running this offense. Well, Rachel Fairbanks was a two-setter offense, part of a two-setter offense last year. Now she's running the 5-1, and she's got some really talented weapons. Tori Stafford on the left side, Olivia Babcock on the right, and they can score from either pin. They've been huge offensive contributors, and this is a young, talented team who get it done on both sides of the ball, one of the best defensive teams in the country, but they can also score at a really high clip. I think Rachel Fairbanks is one of the most dynamic players in college volleyball. Her role has evolved and changed every single year she's played for Dan Fisher. So maybe we'll have a little drama in this uh, <laughs> quarter of the bracket. Pitt and Louisville in the same portion of the bracket. This Louisville team, it's been so exciting to see. Uh, Katie, I know you're excited too, to see the growth that Danny Busboom Kelly has brought to the Louisville program. It feels like every single season that they've played under Danny Busboom Kelly, they've gotten better and they've improved in the postseason. When you are seasoned and you have the experience playing under the bright lights, I have to imagine that helps Holly. Definitely that experience and knowing that you belong there is really important. OK, well, speaking of experience, we want to have one of the most experienced Louisville Cardinals with us. Anna DeBeer is joining us now. Anna, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on the two seed. And I want to know you're a Louisville native. You chose to stay at home. What has been the difference? You've been inside this program that's allowed Louisville to skyrocket over these last few years. I mean, just being here and being from here, um, it's so awesome to see the growth of the sport and how the city has been behind us. So that just made it a really cool ex experience. And one of the things that has stood out over these last few years I've been here. And I know you haven't had a lot of time to digest and look at the bracket, but what do you make of being in the same quarter as Pittsburgh? I think it's extremely exciting. I mean, everyone loves a good rivalry, and Pay is a great team to play, and it's always going to be intense and a good matchup. So we're really looking forward to it and having another shot at taking them on. Anna, we can't wait to watch you play in this tournament. Rest up, get ready to go, and we'll see you on the floor. Best of luck, Anna. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so, so many great players again. Who are some of the players, ladies, that you're watching in this quarter? I really like Mia Tuninga. She was out for the NCAA tournament last year. She's the setter at USC. She's upped her all-around game, and she is a really fun player to watch lead her team. And I want to give Logan Case from Western Michigan a shout-out. She's the first player in Western Michigan history to eclipse 5,000 assists. She also surpassed 1,000 career digs to become the first Bronco to have at least 4,000 assists and 1,000 digs in her career. Who says setters can't play defense? I mean, not setters anybody at this always table. always play defense. Yeah. Well, I got two setters up here. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There's no way I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> All right. We have two quarters of the bracket. People seeing their names called the excitement building. Maybe a sigh of relief. Maybe anticipation for what's to come. 32 teams down. 32 to go. The other side of the bracket is coming up in just moments. The top right portion of the bracket, Wisconsin, the number one seed. They got a big win handing Nebraska its first loss of the season just a few days ago. They started the season 18-0, and making their 27th appearance. And their first, first opponent... Jackson State beat three of the top four seeds on consecutive days in their conference tournament to reach the tournament. Miami, fifth year senior Savannah Vach, the number two, number two in the nation, active leader in career assists, and Grace Lopez leading the conference in kills per set. Miami's opponent, 
will be UNI, Northern Iowa. The Panthers, they've appeared in six of the last eight NCAA tournaments, and they're currently on a 21-match winning streak. That's the fifth longest active streak. Moving on down the upper right portion, the five seed, the Penn State Nittany Lions, Holly. And this is a team that really struggled early on just to find that chemistry. But Mac Pedraza in her last year of college as a grad student, setting this team very experienced and good at putting her hitters in positions, especially Jess Merzik. They've really strengthened as a group and really playing their best volleyball of the season right now. All right, Katie, uh, do you want to reveal I would love to. I would yeah. love to. Oh, can I do it? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah! You beat me to it in the control room. Yeah, what's up, Bulldogs? I jumped the gun a season ago. Congratulations on a heck of a season. Went 14 0 in Ivy League play. Carly Deal, Audrey Leak, get them going against those Nittany Lions. All right, coming up, though, we got another first timer. It's Omaha, their first appearance. They took down top seeded Kansas City in five sets, their first postseason trophy in program history. And they're the 10th different program to win the postseason tournament and represent the Summit, Summit lead, League. Omaha will be facing the Kansas Jayhawks, Jayhawks, who finished second in the Big 12 standings. That's its highest finish since it won the league back in 2016. Who is the three seed in the Wisconsin quarter? Well, Holly, that would be the Purdue Boilermakers. And they are a very young team. Raven Colvin leads the conference in blocks with almost 150. Maddie Shermerhorn leads the conference in digs. This is a very strong mm -hmm. defensive team. And when they need points, Eva Hudson, oh, the yeah. super sophomore, steps up. Purdue's opening round opponent will be Fairfield. The Stags back in the tournament for the first time since 2021, and they enter on a seven-match win streak. They've won 15 of their last 16 matches. Next up, Eastern Illinois. Their second appearance, the first time they have been in the tournament since 2001. Their 28 wins are the most since they joined the OVC back in 1996. And Marquette will open up with Eastern Illinois. They have made 11 of the last 12 tournaments since 2011. Started 2-6 and six this year, but they have gone 18-4 and four since then. The number seven seed in the Wisconsin quarter are the Iowa State Cyclones. Five wins over top 50 RPI teams. Three wins over top 25 RPI teams. And Iowa State's opponent, Katie, that would be the Rainbow Wahine. They won the Big West to automatically qualify. Had to beat Long Beach State in five to get the bid. Talk about drama. Middle blocker Amber IGD is dominant in the middle and a big reason why this Hawaii team clinched. And the team we'll see again in this year's tournament. Back-to-back -back appearances. Their first two tournament appearances in program history. Southeastern Louisiana, they enter the tournament on a 22-match winning streak. They will open up against a dangerous team number two Oregon appeared in the last four tournaments and they ended the season really strong going nine and one Hannah Pukas the active leader in the nation in career assists so these are all the 16 teams in the upper right portion of the bracket this Wisconsin team man what a last week it's been for the Wisconsin Badgers they hand Nebraska its first lots what do you like about Wisconsin right now well I think they're a really scary team to play mostly because of their blocks I mean they've got the biggest front court in the country but Sarah Franklin has gotten better and better she had a medical scare over the summer but has recovered and really hit her full stride coming up big with some kills when they need it but the block Anna Smrak's back healthy in the lineup, and that is the signature for me for Wisconsin. And they just put so much pressure on their opponents. Yeah, Wisconsin, definitely a dangerous team. And you know Kelly Sheffield's got them going at just the right time. You see their all-around game and where that ranks. And their hitting percentage, their defense, their blocks per set, their top ten in all three of those categories. And they head in with a lot of momentum after being the only team this season that has been able to defeat the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Okay, they're the number one seed in this portion of the bracket. The number two seed, the Oregon Ducks. They have a lot of great pieces, but it starts with Hannah Pukas. Oh, they're so much fun to watch. And Oregon runs such a fast-tempo offense. Hannah Pukas, as you mentioned, she does such a good job of moving her hitters around, moving them inside and out, and really keeping opposing defenses and blockers on their toes. And when you look at some of the game film that we're going to break down for you right now, 
It's like she's playing chess and her opponents are playing checkers. This is a 31 gap set here to Colby Neal. A lot of teams run this in transition or in free ball situations, but the timing is perfect between setter and middle blocker, making it really difficult for you to track and stay in front of it as a blocker. This next one is a rip. It's another gap set to the same location Neal just attacked from, but this time Morgan Lewis comes inside from the outside pin. Look at all the net Lewis has to work with. Makes for an easy kill for the Oregon Ducks. And Hannah Pukas is also an active setter, so she keeps defenses honest. By jump setting here, she's going to bring both blockers with her. She runs Kara McGee behind on a quick A or 6 set. Blockers try to recover, but it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. It's the movement and the speed of this offense that makes it so much fun to watch, not so fun to play against. Yeah, well, it's been impressive who Matt Ulmer has brought into this program. You get Kara McGee, you mentioned her, a veteran in the middle who has just elevated Oregon mm -hmm. as well. And it must be really fun for Hannah Pukas to set her and all of these weapons that she has. Okay, so those are the two teams there that we focused on. But again, some great players. And guys, I'm taking the players to watch in this oh, one. Oh, you are. Oh, and we're starting out with the Fairfield Stags. Can we get some love for Maya Walker here, ladies? Second in the conference in hitting percentage. She is a player to watch for me. Yeah, and I love watching Eva Hudson. Holly, you mentioned it earlier. She had an incredible freshman season. She's followed up with even better production this season in her sophomore year. Fourth in kills per set in Big Ten play. And then Jess Merzik. I talked about her earlier, but she is the full, complete player. Six rotations, and she is dominant. Do you feel the nerves out there a little bit? Are some yeah. teams sweating? We only There's have only 16 more spots. Just one. Are we ready? Ooh. Let's go. Shall we? <laughs> Stanford, the number one seed in the bottom right portion of the bracket. So we'll start from the bottom and work our way up. Of course, Stanford has more national championships than any other program at nine. They won their second straight conference title, their fifth under coach Kevin Hambly. And they will open up against Fresno State, Katie. In Lisa Rosen's first year, Fresno State advanced to the Mountain West title game for the first time in program history. They lost the first two sets to Colorado State and pulled off the reverse sweep. Bravo, Fresno. Congratulations on a hard-earned Mountain West title. Also going to Palo Alto. You see Santa Barbara, the Gauchos, making their back in the tournament for the first time since 2019. They lost in the Big West semifinals, but they are the regular season champion. Sixth overall for them and their opponent, the Houston Cougars, making their debut in the Big 12. A veteran starting lineup, four grad students, two seniors and a junior. They ended the season strong going nine and two. The number five seed. Holly, that would be the Arizona State Sun Devils. What a turnaround. First year head coach J.J. Van Neal has Arizona State playing their best volleyball in years. Their plus 14 wins on the season. Huge turnaround and they've got a dominant opposite player in Marta Levinska. But they serve really tough and they put so much pressure on their opponents from the service line. So the Sun Devils will start prepping for... The Georgia Bulldogs boasting the SEC Player of the Year in Sophie Fisher. She leads the conference in points per set, total points, total blocks, and total kills. Weber State is also in three appearances, but their first appearance since 2020. They were the number four seed in their conference tournament and defeated Montana State in five sets. They also trailed 6-3 to three in the fifth set and still got it done. Weber State's going to start off with BYU, Holly. And this is a very talented team. Their first year in the Big 12, Whitney Bauer, an experienced setter. She's got four hitters hitting over 280. And Erin Livingston leads the team in kills. She can dominate a match. Eight spots remaining. The nerves continue. Mm -hmm. But not for this team. The number three seed, the Tennessee Lady Volunteers. Where do I start? Caroline Kerr, redshirt freshman, taking over at the setting position. Morgan Fingal has been there for 85 years, and they're so glad that she is. Tennessee is the number three seed in this portion of the bracket. They're going to open up against High Point. High Point coming in their seventh appearance in the NCAA tournament. Moving on up the bracket. Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers boast the Sunbelt Freshman of the Year, Jalen Stout. She recorded her 14th, not double-double, triple-double as they defeated James Madison in their conference tournament. 
Western Kentucky is Coastal's first opponent, Katie. And I'm a huge fan of Travis Hudson and the job he does every year at WKU. They have been so dominant in Conference USA play. They've gone undefeated for the last five seasons. They have not lost a CUSA match since 2018, posting a 74-match conference winning streak. That, to me, is unbelievable. Moving on up the bracket, the seven seed SMU, their third conference title, the first since 2016. They're currently on a 15 match winning streak that includes nine straight sweeps. Emma Clothier getting the job done for SMU. Their opponent is Texas State. The Bobcats posted eight consecutive 21 seasons. They're back in the tournament for the first time since 2020 after narrowly missing the previous two tournaments. Two more spots to go. Texas A&M, the Aggies, Jamie Morrison, first season leading this Aggie program. The 16 wins, that's the most since 23 in 2019 for Texas A&M. But they'll face a familiar foe right down the road in Austin, Texas. The defending national champions, 21 consecutive NCAA tournament appearances. They won their seventh consecutive Big 12 title in their final season in the conference as they'll move over to the SEC next year. So that is the field. We know all 64 teams that will play in this year's NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship.